thank you everyone for coming to the Lower Columbia chapter of the Ice Age Floods Institute meeting tonight. And we usually meet at the Tualatin Heritage Center, but we're still doing Zoom meetings. And tonight we are having Dr. Scott Burns speak. And as you know, Scott Burns is retired from being the head professor of geology at Portland State University. He lived in Switzerland for a number of years, teaching and leading hikes. And he's frequently consulted on local television whenever the earth moves. You might have seen him recently. He also co-authored the second edition version of Cataclysms on the Columbia. So thank you so much for joining us. And I now turn it over to Dr. Scott Burns. Thank you very much, Sylvia. And thank you to all of you for waiting earlier tonight. <clears throat> it has been a nightmare uh, for the last uh, two hours um, with all of the technical stuff I have. Two talks about the plant adaptations of the Swiss Alps, animal adaptations yesterday in my office. I combined them into a nice brief um, combination in my office, got home and put it onto the computer tonight and said, cannot read. Uh, and so I had to go back to plan B, that is the plant adaptation talk and the animal adaptation. And we have had the hardest time trying to get it onto the share screen. Can everybody see? my title, which is Plant Adaptations in the Swiss Alps. Yes. Yes, we can, can see it, Scott. OK, well, thank you. So it, early in my career, from 1970 to 75, my first five years of teaching as a college professor, I taught at a place called the American College of Switzerland. Here we are in the beautiful Swiss Alps. I'd come out of my chalet in the morning, and in 270 degrees in all directions, there were mountains everywhere. Um, the second year I was there, the dean said, Scott, we want you to teach a class called uh, Alpine Ecology. I say, I know nothing about Alpine Ecology. He said, teach yourself, uh, because ecology was a new term that was coming in. We had had the world's first Earth Day, and people were using the term ecology, which it had been around for a long time. And so what I did is hooked up with a local uh, person in my town who taught me every one of the plants that were there. And then also the animals. And I taught a class for four years called Alpine Ecology. And when I left Switzerland, I was more of an Alpine Ecologist than a geologist. Uh, and now I've become more of a geologist. But I love going back and talking about the Swiss Alps. And, and this is basically <laughs> going to be a talk about mountain ecology. When you get into the mountains, the same uh, mountain life zones are found everywhere. Uh, and, and then you just have different plants and trees that are found in all of those. And how do the plants, how do the animals become adapted to mountains? And so that's what I want to explore tonight using the Swiss Alps as an example uh, for that. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about mountain life zones. As you go up the mountains, um, the trees and the life changes. Uh, ending up in the alpine zone, the uh, land above the trees, where you have adaptations to that harsh environment. I'll talk a little bit about where the alpine flora came from, and then a little bit about the flowering season, what season begins and ends, because we're right now starting our flowering season right now. Uh, and then some of the edible plants that we have got. So in any mountain range that you have in the world, you start out in the bottom, and the valley bottom is called the Colleen Zone. Then you go into the first forest, which is called the Montane Zone, the second forest, which is a subalpine zone, and then the land above the trees called the Alpine Zone. And then you get to the zone up above called the Nival Zone, which is the glaciers and the rock outcrops. And there are lichens, for instance, that are growing on them, and then places in between. There is an ecotone in between called the forest under ecotone, where all the forest trees are all stunted into the forest under ecotone called the Krumholtz. And so what we're, we're going to do is start at the bottom in the Alps and work our way all the way up to the top. We have the exact same thing in the, the Cascades, it, also when you go into the Rockies, also when you go down into California. Uh, into the mountains that you have down there. You have these different zones that you have got. So in Switzerland, the valley bottoms 
uh, this is the Rhone Valley, which was right below where I used to live. Lots and lots of vineyards. And so the highest elevation that the vines would grow, that is the end of the Colleen zone. And then you are into the uh, Montane zone. And the Montane zone, as you can see here, is mostly deciduous trees that you have got. You've got some maples and some sycamores and things like that. And then as you go up in the montane zone, then you get more and more conifer trees and less of the deciduity upper montane. Uh, and then you get into the upper montane where you just have only a couple of the deciduous trees. And then you get to the area above where it's all conifer trees. That's a subalpine zone uh, that you have got. And then you can see the area up here. Uh, in the center part, that it, there, that's the land above the trees. That is the alpine zone. And so we're working our way up to there to see the adaptations that you have there. Subalpine zone uh, is primarily made up of Norwegian spruce. And it's a gorgeous tree that you have. Also, in all of your uh, violins, your Stradivarius, and all of those are all made out of wood from this particular tree that you have got. Each one of the uh, trees, the conifer trees, can be told differently from one another by the cones. And these are the cones that you see from the Norwegian spruce. At Christmas time, all the chalets in Switzerland are decorated with cones and branches from these types of trees. Now, other parts in the drier areas, you can see there, this forest is sub, uh, the subalpine zone. These are the larch pine trees. And then back here, arola pine trees. Um, and, and, and so let me just show you some of the large pine trees up here. They're very wispy, willowy that you have got. And we have them here in uh, North America, especially up in uh, northern um, Washington, British Columbia, etc. And the, the genus species name is Larix decidua. Uh, and the, you can see tiny, tiny little cones. And then, but the neat thing is this tree loses its needles every year. This is the only conifer tree that loses its needles. And it, in the fall, the colors, the fall colors in the large pine trees uh, is unbelievably beautiful in the mountains, not only in Switzerland, but also in the Rockies. Roll of pine trees do not uh, change. Then you have this forest tundra ecotone, and one of the most famous flowers that is found in this ecotone is a rhododendron called alpenrose. We had our most famous dairy here in Portland um, called Alpenrose. Uh, and, and this is the Alpenrose flower that you have uh, here. And it's found only in that, uh, that, that forest tundra ecotone between the forest and the alpine zone up above. Uh, and it's one of the most famous flowers. And then also in this zone, all the trees are contorted. They are stunted, they are bent. Uh, they're called crumholtz. Well, this is the forest tundra ecotone. You can see up here, these are the, this is the Tour d'Ai and the Tour de Famelon. These are the mountains that were in back of my chalet. We go hiking up in here all of the time. And here we're right at the forest tundra ecotone. And then you get in the land above the trees, the alpine zone. That's where all of the plants are built close to the ground. And you get down on your hands and knees and do belly botany. You can see we've got some beautiful spring gentians here uh, in front of us. And then up above that, then you have the Nival stage, the glaciers that you have got uh, in the distance. Uh, and then in the Nival stage, you have lots and lots of lichens like this, uh, 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 Lichenora, and it is there. So how are plants adapted to the land above the trees, the alpine zone? First of all, many of them take cushion shape. And the most common of all of the cushion-shaped plants is the moss campion, Silene acaulis. Not only is it found all over the Alps, but is also found here in the Cascades and the Rockies uh, and the Sierras. Little tiny flowers. And so an adaptation to, in this area is small flowers. And then big root systems and cushions. Here's another one. This is uh, rock jasmine, Andrasaki. Uh, where they just find cracks and they grow these beautiful cushions in there. Or purple saxifrage. This is one of the cu first cushion plants to actually flower in the spring after the snows melt. And it has waxy leaves, as you can see here, up close, and that keeps the water in, so it's an adaptation to living in a very, very dry environment, a land above the trees. Now, color is another thing 
that flowers use to attract pollinators because there are not a lot of pollinators up there. Uh, lots of wild pansies, not in the alpine zone as much, more in the subalpine, but I wanted to show that for the color. But here, uh, here happens to be, um, um, this is, oh, the alpine buttercup. Uh, and it too is a little cushion plant that you see down here and the beautiful white flowers in a little clump, an adaptation to this environment. Another adaptation as you go from the bottom of the mound all the way to the top is of plants get smaller and smaller. Why? To conserve energy. And a very, very common plant is the forget-me-not, Myosotis uh, is the genus name. Uh, and, and down in the forest, in the lower, uh, in the montane, and the subalpine, most of the uh, forget-me-nots are like this. But then you get up into the alpine zone, and look at how big they are. They are very, very tiny, as you can see here. And then I always have Swiss Army knives in here to show you for scale. And this is a cushion plant of, uh, of the, of the forget-me-not. Uh, and again, um, perfectly adapted to living above tree line. Uh, and then here is a forest. Uh, this is uh, actually Salix, uh, <clears throat> which is a willow. And you can walk over a forest. It, it, it makes a mat that is found up above tree line. And that's how these willows grow in that particular environment. One of the most famous flowers of the Alps, and you'll see it on all the embroidery, is the trumpeter gentian. And basically, the flower comes out first, and then after it reproduces, then the leaves come out and the rest of the plant comes out. And so you'll just see these all over. In the spring, this is the spring gentian. You will sh I showed you some just a few minutes ago. And they, uh, you'll see fields up above tree line of these tiny, just one little flower coming out of the ground. Uh, absolutely beautiful and one of the most famous flowers there. And another one is called the past flower. Uh, and uh, Positella is, is it, you can see here, there's a moss campion in the background. And they, are, they have a lot of fuzz on the outside. That's called tomentum. Uh, and what it does is when the flower is all closed up, it, it, it creates kind of like a greenhouse effect inside and keeps heat inside, allowing the plant to have energy in order to uh, reproduce and, and open up uh, for the beauty. Uh, that you have got. Uh, also, there are some incredible orchids. This is the black vanilla orchid. And look at, it's not very big, but it is actually an orchid and incredible smells. Highly protected because a lot of people would go hiking in the Alps. They pull off the, the poor plant and, you, and and show, oh, kids smell this. And then they throw it away and the poor thing didn't get a chance to reproduce. So they're fairly rare in the Alps. And here's some black vanilla orchids, actually more reddish variety uh, in that particular case here. Another adaptation is growing in cracks and little clumps. And this is the live long saxifrage. And you can see those little clumps that you see down here, energy conservation, when it reproduces, up comes one huge flowering part that you see here. Uh, and again, I've got the Swiss Army knife in that photo. So a lot of these alpine plants make up what we call rock gardens that are found all over the world. And very, very common in Europe. This is in our village in Lausanne, Switzerland, where I used to live. And all of those varieties were originally found all up above tree line and now have been adapted to lower elevations. Then the most famous flower in the Alps is Edelweiss. And it also has tomentum all over the flowers, as you can see here. Uh, it is highly adapted to, to the alpine zone. In Switzerland, it's, it's against a lot of picket. It's been picked into oblivion. Austria and the Alps, you'll find more of it than we do uh, in Switzerland. Uh, and here's some more. Uh, uh, and in fact, when I would uh, take students up to the base of the Matterhorn, and that in the summer times, while I was teaching there those five years, I was a guide at the Matterhorn. And, and take the cable car up to the base of the Matterhorn and, and Zermatt and then walk down. And I knew my places where the Edelweiss would always be found. And here is an alpine aster. Uh, again, reduction of vegetative uh, forms that are there. Here is what it normally looks like in the field. And again, you can see my Swiss army knife there. Where do you find most of the uh, Edelweiss in Switzerland? In the graveyards. All of the graveyards 
have generally have a lot of the alpine plants on top of them. And so I would always take groups with me and we would go to the graveyards to see the Edelweiss because it's very uncommon to find it in the Swiss Alps. It's just been picked into oblivion. So where did a lot of these alpine varieties come from? be up in the Arctic. But then when the glaciers came down during the last glacial period, all of those alpine varieties moved in front of the front of the glaciers. And so the area between the Swiss Alps that you can see here and Northern Europe had primarily alpine zone types of varieties. Then when the ice melted, a lot of them went back into the mountains and then all the way back to the Ar Arctic. The truncheon was one of those. It originated in the Arctic and now is also found in the, the mountains. Another one um, happens, <clears throat> happens to be Primula auricula. Uh, and uh, it is, again, one of these clumps that you can see here growing in cracks, very rare in the Alps. Uh, and um, it is called bear's ear primula or primrose that you have got. Bellflower, a huge plant uh, that is not typical typical of the alpine variety originated came down more in the lower part of the alpine and the subalpine and one of the most beautiful and very very delicate comes out right after the snow melts uh is canella that we've got here here's an up close one that i took right here uh, and you'll see this in all of the embroidery in switzerland uh and it is a very big delicate little one a little uh clump that grows down here and then the flower comes up right after the snow melts. One of my most favorite ones, that this one actually came up from, uh, down in Italy uh, and I, I love this picture that I took here. This is the globe flower, Atrolius europius, uh, and it grows primarily in the subalpine zone in the alpine zone. And you can see we're in the right in the alpine zone looking down on a tarn like that is down here. And then how is it um, pollinated? Because it's completely closed. It looks like a globe, hence the name globe flower. Well, there's certain little bugs that love crawling inside and pollinating it and, and doing well. Now, how does the season, uh, vegetative season start and end? Well, as soon as the uh, snow melts, the first flowers to come out are the crocus. Uh, they're actually called purple crocus, and that, that one you can see there's mostly white, but here you can see a whole bunch of, of purple and white. And here, in my yard, I just started my flowering season, and my crocus just came out just this past week. Uh, and then here is a whole bunch of the others. They're all the same genus and uh, species, crocus pro purpurea. Uh, and then, then you have all the flowers that I've been showing you already, and then the end of the season starts when the thistles start coming into block and the uh, and then also fireweed epilobium and gustafolium i can remember that name and i can't remember what i did yesterday i don't know but this is fireweed we have this all over the pacific northwest especially in places where fire has been uh, and coming through it and the disturbance has occurred but the last flower to come out is the fall crocus and that's colchicum. It's a it's not it's a different genus species, uh, and so the season begins with a crocus and ends with a crocus, and it's kind of a fun uh, finality that you have got. Now you've heard the story when you're in the mountains. Don't eat yellow snow. You know where that came from, okay? Well, the other thing is you don't want to eat red snow. And red snow uh, is actually an algae, and it's a green algae that has a uh, red color. Uh, and, and what happens is as the snow melts, all this algae is concentrated, and towards the end of the snow melting season, you will see these big red patches. It's called watermelon snow. You don't, uh, you don't want to eat it. Now, people will go up and grab it, and they say, hey, kids, smell it. And you smell it, and oh, it smells just like watermelon. But you don't want to do it unless you are constipated because it does have a wee bit of effect on your body and it will clean you out. Uh, and, and so it is very common in the mountains all over the Alps. And we also have this in, in uh, the Cascades and in the Rockies. And as you get uh, lower elevations, you have the common goat's beard. So this is down in the village, um, my village, right, right below my chalet. Uh, and it's, it's an interesting <clears throat> composite flower. 
in the morning, it's beautiful, all opened up. You come back in the afternoon, everything's all closed up. And uh, it has this physiological effect that it closes up in the afternoon. And I don't know if that's an adaptation, to getting less animals eating you later on in the afternoon or what. Another very famous uh, flower in, in the Alps um, uh, it, it is called the um, carline thistle. And it's a thistle. Uh, and it actually comes out for most of the summer, but it's called the weatherman. And all the farmers know where there is the carline thistle in their fields. And if it is all closed up, it tells, it tells us that it's going to rain. If it's old, it tells us the weather's going to be good. And all of the farmers in the mountains want to know, do they put their cows in the sheds or they not and they did competition when I was there, the weatherman in Geneva versus the carline thistle in our village. And guess who won? The carline thistle. Uh, and so uh, it, it's an interesting adaptation. As you get down into the subalpine zone, then you get into the incredible lilies that are there. This is the St. Bruno's lily that is there. And, and I love this one. This is called the viviparous bistort. Or, or, and, and all of these little flowers here are not flowers. They're complete. They're called bull bills, an adaptation to living. And this is primarily in the alpine zone, uh, is uh, because you don't have to produce a flower, produce a seed, seed go to the ground, produce a new plant, and then it grows into a new one. Basically, the flower is the new plant. It falls off and then forms, a, it takes root, and you don't have to go through the seed stage. And, and, and it's an interesting one. Uh, also, when you uh, see this particular one, this is one of the buttercups that is found in the wetland areas. Uh, and, and so that, it, it, wetlands have a lot of yellows and white. Look at all this white that is here. And this is called cotton grass. And if you look at it, it just feels and uh, looks exactly like cotton. Uh, and it is very, very typical of your wetland areas uh, in the mountains. We have some of this in, in our mountains too. The rocky areas, uh, if you're lucky, have unbelievably large amounts of poppies. Poppies have long roots that go down into the ground and will stabilize all of the uh, rocks that are there and stabilize the slopes from moving. And they're off in the distance, that's Mondor, Mountain of Gold, um, uh, I see from my chalet. And this plant here is Dryas octopetala. This is called Mountain Avens. It is a very unique alpine plant uh, found all over the alpine, not only in the Alps, but it is also found in all of the major northern hemisphere mountains, the Rocky Mountains, the Sierras, the Cascades, and all the way up into the Arctic. If you go up to Norway and Sweden uh, and uh, in northern Canada and Alaska, you will find this particular plant. And it is a, it's a mat shape. It's a beautiful adaptation for the alpine zone. Also, you find succulent plants. This is sedum, lanceolatum, that is found up there. And it, it, for this dry environment, these succulent plants are found very, very tiny, though. Another succulent plant that is found generally in the subalpine is the house leek. A house leek is Semper Vivum Tectorum. I've got them growing in my garden here in Oregon, and, and you'll find a lot of uh, ones reproduces. You know, one of these little areas that you see right here uh, will eventually a flower come out of it, and that's how it re reproduces. The Alps, you will see beautiful colors, especially July and early August, of all of these different flowers talking about. When you see primarily yellow colors, it tells you that you have had a lot of grazing. Or Cali is right up in this particular area here. Uh, and, and below us, they had a lot of cow pastures down here, a lot of manure, a high, high amount of nitrogen in the soils, hence the yellow colors that you have got there. But then when you have areas that are only used for haying and no poop and, and uh, from the all the cows you get all of the geraniums and all the multiple colors that you see in this particular color here now this one you have to be worried about this is nettle common nettles uh and um and so as you're hiking in the mountains you don't want to touch it this this will cause a little rash uh, there's no poison poison ivy or anything like that there is here but this is also used for soup the Swiss love to make soups out of common nettles, and it tastes absolutely good. 
as you're hiking in the mountains, you'll see a lot of stuff that looks like rhubarb, and it is. It is called monk's rhubarb, uh, and, but it's not good to eat at all. Uh, and they, they feed it actually to the cows. It, it grows back to a lot of manure uh, that has been collected outside of the manure barns, and that's where you see most of that like that. Uh, and then here is the great white hellebore, uh, and it is high poisonous, and the, the cows do not eat it. And, but there's another plant that looks kind of like this, and that's the great gentian. And the yellow gentian is not poisonous. But the cows know that when they see this big, beautiful gentian like this, to stay away because it may be this, which is poisonous and might kill them. Uh, the, the roots of the yellow gentian are used to make an aperitif or, uh, uh, called gentian. Uh, you know, the French, it lived in the French-speaking part of Switzerland. We had very, very rich meals and, and with the uh, raclettes and fondues and everything like that. Well, uh, you would eat gentian at the end of the meal, and it would just dissolve all those rich things in your stomach, and, and it would dissolve all, all the calories. And so uh, made from this particular one. Lots of orchids down in the uh, Tain zone primarily, which is kind of fun. And also uh, you've got campanula. Uh, campanula, um, or the harebells uh, that you have got, gorgeous. And then also columbine. I mean, columbine is the state flower of Colorado, multiple colors, but in the Alps, it's just one color like you see there. Common bistorts, the roots are incredible, uh, and you can actually eat the roots from these particular ones. Uh, and then this is, a, a lot of times they call this old man of the mountain. That's actually the seed of this plant, which is the mountain anemone. It's found in the alpine and subalpine zone. I, got, I have a fine franc pea down here instead of a uh, Swiss army knife there. And some absolutely beautiful orchids that are found there too. Buttercups are ubiquitous. They make up the majority of all of the yellow flowers that you have got. The Rachelis montanas, uh, and they are well adapted to mountains uh, that you see there. But then you also um, have got um, monkshood, uh, and, and, which is highly poisonous. And this is primarily in the subalpine and the montane zone. And it is pollinated by bumblebees. Actually, the bug on here is actually a fly. But it, uh, so where you have a big bumblebee population, you'll have a lot of monkshood. You also have foxglove, which is also very, very poisonous. I don't know what pollinates it. I've forgotten what that is. And then here is an insectivore. This is called the alpine butterwort. Flies fly in there, and the, the plant just closes up and eats it. Uh, and, and so it's like a Venus flytrap that you have got. How about the edible plants? Uh, as you go hiking in the mountains, lots and lots of wild uh, strawberries like you got, and then vaccinium, wild blueberries everywhere. And so generally August is the month of all of the berries and also wild hazelnuts. And the Swiss love hazelnuts. They put the, the hazelnut in their uh, milk chocolate and is a, a very, very um, a common thing. And then this is everywhere on all the rocks and this is wild thyme. You've heard of parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. And so the Swiss go hiking through the mountains and collect all of these flowers and they those are their herbs that they will use in the winter time. Uh, now this one here, beautiful white flower that you see here, uh, absolutely beautiful. Um, and this is the elderberry. It turns into a red uh, berry and it makes great wine and so the Swiss love making a little bit of elderberry wine now at the same time you got to be careful because it, it looks kind of like another black be a red berry which is highly poisonous and so you have to be careful is it going to be this the good stuff or this the bad stuff you want to keep away from the bad stuff there and a very beautiful composite is arnica arnica is highly medicinal a lot of times you'll go to the doctor and then instead of saying, oh, go down and get this drugstore um, prescription, they'll give you a tisane. That is a tea made out of herbs. And the most common herb that is used in most of the tisanes is arnica. It, it solves many, many, many medicinal problems that you have got. Uh, and I love this one here. This is juniper. And you're saying, hey, what, what's, what's juniper? What do you eat? Well, the berries are used to make uh, the flavoring going into gin. And in this, uh, the junipers are found primarily in the subalpine zone and the alpine zone. Uh, and so the Europeans are really into the gin that you've got. So many of these flowers that you, I showed you, 
uh, you'll see kids picking them. Lower elevations, it doesn't matter. As you get higher in the elevations, they don't. They say do not pick the flowers because you're uh, interrupting the reproductive cycle that you have got. And as a result, you you don't want to pick that and destroy all of the reproduction that you've got. And then you look at this one. Here's a picture, and look at all the palm trees. That's not Switzerland. That's not the Swiss Alps. Oh, yes, it is. This is the Italian Alps, which are further south. And, and so we do have very, very mild climates in Switzerland. Uh, and so that is the story of the plant and animal, or the plant adaptation. I'm going to get into the animal ones in just a second. In the Alps. And the Swiss shouting out. I can see all these plants that Scott told you about. And they will... I'll leave you with one last thing that they will shout out, forget me not. All right, so that is the first part of my talk. Um, so I'm going to leave it right there. Okay, we, got, we, did, we did it. Oh, I love it. Okay, so to end with, I just want to talk a little bit about plant or uh, animal adaptations in the Alps. I'm going to start with the domesticated type of animals. Uh, and then uh, get into the wild animals uh, uh, and end up there. But again, remember the mountain life zones. Go from the uh, Colleen zone, montane zone, subalpine, and uh, forest hundred ecotone, and then the alpine zone. I have to throw in the Swiss part because this was, uh, in, in my village, um, this was Bruno. Uh, he's just a puppy. And then I watched him grow every year into a gigantic dog. He was up at the, the top of the mountain uh, where we would do all of our skiing all of the time. So, uh, and they were uh, this uh, uh, type of dog was developed at the St. Bernard Monastery, which is on the border between Switzerland and um, Italy. Uh, so cows are a big deal in the Alps. Uh, and the two major cows that you have got in my region, it was the Simmental cow. Uh, big milk producer that you can see right here. And the other one is Swiss brown cow, which was more common in northern uh, northern part of, of uh, Switzerland. It's smaller, it's still good. And so what happens is uh, in the in the fall, uh, they well, in, first of all, in the spring, they take all the cows up into the pastures above tree line, and they decorate the 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 cows with. Um, uh, first of all, they put the big belt onto them, so the shepherds will know where they are. The shepherds all get dressed up in their costumes, wear their little hats, uh, and then they will hike them up to, uh, uh, up into the mountains. And then all summer long, the cows sit above tree line, contented. All they do is eat alpine flowers, uh, and then they produce milk. And they, and all of the pastures down in the village are used for making hay. And they actually get two cuttings out of it. Uh, they cut and, and all those wildflowers they showed you before. They dry it and they put it in to the, um, into the barns in the village. And then uh, they have portable milking machines. They get up above tree line into the alpine zone, milk the cows daily, and then they make cheeses out of it. Or they also take the milk down into the valley. And then in the fall, then you bring all the cows back down the mountain, uh, put the flowers back on, put the bells on them, and everybody gets dressed up. And so the, this is called the uh, parade um, uh, going up and down. So we used to have a lot more um, animals in the Alps that are now no longer there. Uh, the lynx was one. The only place you'll find them in, in, in the Alps are in the zoos. Also, bears uh, you'd be very, very common. The capital of Switzerland is Bern, which means bear. This is the bear pit that they do have there, and you can go feed them carrots there. And wolves were very common. Just populations just wiped out many of the uh, different animals that are there, including the wild cat. It looks like a lynx, but it actually is a wild cat. Uh, so many of those animals are no longer there. Uh, now, how do we identify the animals that are in the area? Uh, you look at their scat. That is the scientific name for poop. And every animal poops differently. And if you see on the left-hand side over here, if you see a lot of hair in it, you know it's a carnivore. But if there isn't any hair in it, and it is probably a vegetarian that you have got, and all the shapes and sizes 
uh, would uh, would tell you what the diet was of the animal, number one, and what the animal was. And so in my alpine ecology class, I had my students pick flowers and press them. So press the flowers, had to have 25 of those in the spring, and then they had to have five different animal scat. Uh, they had to be well-dried animal scat and then identify them. And, uh, and the students did not like picking animal scat. And in fact, they changed my name from Scott Burns to Scat Burns. Actually, I have a, uh, a certificate addressed to Professor Scott Burns. We hate picking up animal scat. So I'm going to be showing you, because many of these animals you never get to see, but what's the animal in the area? So let's start out with the hooked animals. And I think the most majestic of all of the, animal, uh, the hooked animals is the ibex, I-B-E-X or Ibex in en Francais. Uh, and, and this is a picture I took on the Alpha lands at the top uh, up in northern Switzerland of just uh, five Ibexes, or no, six. There's six over here. Uh, the males have the biggest horns, and then the females the smaller ones. Uh, and uh, very, very contented. Uh, they're vegetarian, but when they go into mating, oh, in the, in the fall, you will ha have incredible knocking of heads of the male ibexes. And so they live primarily in the alpine zone. Uh, and they keep away from humans. They're up in the rocky slopes. Another animal that lives in the forest in the wintertime uh, and then goes up above tree lines uh, is the chamois or chamois in English. Uh, and it's also a mountain goat. And here are a whole bunch of chamois that uh, we have in the area there. They t uh, also love the rocky surfaces to keep away from people, and they have pincer types of hoofs that allow them to go up and down. In the wintertime, they have a very, very thick coat. This is another adaptation of living in the mountains. They go down into the forest tundra ecotone and into the subalpine zone to find food in the wintertime. Uh, and so those are the two major mountain goats that you have got. Now, in the subalpine, uh, in the montane zone, you have deer. But we've wiped out most of the populations. This is the most common deer. This is the roe deer, R-O-E deer. Uh, and they are not very big. They are only, this, uh, only about two to three feet high. Uh, and they do have hunting season every year. But why would you kill a deer that is like a size of a dog? Uh, are a few of these left. It's, uh, it's red deer. It's actually our equivalent of the elk. But they've been hunted into oblivion, and there are only in two or three places in the Alps where you actually can find this particular animal. They're majestic. Um, and so most of the deer that are around are the much tinier roe deer that you have got. And what is their diet? Uh, uh, the winter diet is more pellet sized like this, and the summer diet more mushy. And so you can tell, is it fresh or is it uh, older? type of scat that you have got. And I'm going to turn all of you into scatologists by the end of the night here. Also, you've got lots of foxes, and they live primarily in the, uh, uh, the uh, subalpine zone and the montane zone. Uh, we used to have a fox that would come up to our chalet uh, every night. We put a few scraps out for them. Now, this animal is the common stoat, or it's the weasel, S-T-O-A-T. Uh, and um, as you can see, it's white belly and brown upper part. In the wintertime, what happens? Its adaptation is it, all of its fur. It's an adaptation to living in the snowy environment. In the wintertime, we call the common weasel the ermine. And you probably heard of ermine coats. Ermine coats are coats of weasel type of animals that are pure white. Uh, fur coats just are not in vogue anymore. But when I was a kid, uh, they were. And here's another picture of an, another ermine there. Uh, we also have other members of the weasel family. Uh, uh, this one uh, is the pine marten, a little bit bigger in size, living primarily in the forest, mostly in the montane zone and the subalpine zone that you can see. Does not change color. Here's another picture uh, of, the, uh, of the, them. And again, their, their scat is like a cat. It's loaded with lots and lots of hair. Now, they don't have coyotes there. They don't have wolves anymore. And so these, so when you see this type, you know that you're looking at one of the weasel family that is there. Another weasel family, badger. Badgers are primarily found in the montane zone, lower elevations, and good digging animals that are there. 
And then you have a lot of little rodents that you don't know about. You go into the Canton of Valais. This is very, very close to Zermatt. And all of the hay barns that you see there have the schist, a rock uh, that they have on the edges to keep the mice from getting up into the uh, hay. Very, very smart. And it's an adaptation uh, in those particular environments. These are called mazoos. Uh, and, and so what are the animals that are becoming uh, into them? Well, the common field mouse, uh, deer mouse that you have got, like this little guy here, or the vole, V-O-L-E. Uh, and, they, and the vole has smaller ears and smaller eyes, more rounded front. Uh, and right now we have a lot of voles here in the Willamette Valley, and there is a huge epidemic of them. Uh, they, uh, they are just like bazillions and bazillions of voles uh, that we have there, and they're eating up all of our hay fields, including my hay field that we've got. So voles and uh, field mice are the main ones. And then you have insectivores, insectivores. This is the common shrew. This is found at lower elevations. Look at its color of, of, of its fur. You go up above tree line, the alpine shrew is black. And so there's this melanism in all of the animals that have fur. As you go up the mountain, they get darker and darker fur. And that is an adaptation to living in a colder type of environment. Voles are the same way. Remember I showed you that is a vole at lower elevation. There is an alpine vole. And it is completely black. And it's probably the most aesthetic animal in the Alps because it goes out flowers that I showed you and surrounds its hole uh, with cut flowers. Uh, and, and so as you're hiking in the, up above tree line and all of a sudden you find a hole with a whole bunch of dead flowers around it, you say that is an alpine vole hole. Uh, there, it, it, I'm teaching all these things. I'm, I'm trying to get you to all to go to Switzerland and go hiking. Now below tree line and sometimes above tree line you have the hair. Uh, uh, but it is called the snowshoe hair. Why? Because in the wintertime it turns white. That's an adaptation to living in a snowy environment. And also it has fins in between all of the feet. Uh, and, and so it can run across the snow because it, it's like web feet that are on that. And so it does not hibernate in the wintertime. It lives above the ground. Uh, and it, you can see uh, two steps and then one and one. Uh, those will tell you you have... Uh, um, a snowshoe hair. And if you want to know what that looks like, right next to it. A lot of squirrels that you've got in the trees, especially in the subalpine zone uh, and the montane zone. How do you know if there's squirrels in the trees other than the chirping that you hear? You look at the bottom and when you see the cones there, they're halfway eaten up. It is telling you there are squirrels living in the trees up above. Uh, and then after all the snow melts in the spring, you will see all of these little mounds that are all the way through. What happens is these little guys, moles, dig up. Uh, they don't hibernate. And they tunnel up into the snow and then uh, they take all of the soil from their tunnels. They have to put it someplace. So they pack them into those tunnels in the snow. I love this picture because this taking my garden. This little mole died. So I just rammed him in a hole there and took an up-close picture. Pretty good picture of a, a mole. Uh, and then a, an animal that I'd never run into in North America was a hedgehog. Hedgehogs are primarily in the Colleen zone and uh, in the Montane zone. Uh, and they're insectivores. Uh, and they, will, they are nocturnal. They come out at nighttime, and you'll see them in all of the villages. They love insects. Uh, they look like a porcupine, but they are found there, and, and a lot of kids' books are about hedgehogs uh, in Europe. As you go hiking up above tree line, and the, in the rocky areas, if you listen for whistles, <whistles> I can't whistle, but it, the whistling more and more and more, you see these little guys, these are marmots, and we have them here in North America in the Sierra. Um, they live primarily above tree line. In rocky areas, they uh, are harems. The male sits above the entrance, and he guards where the women, the females, go out and bring food back to him and then into the, uh, the tunnels that are found in under there. If an eagle flies over or humans come around, he starts whistling. They call them whistle pigs, uh, and, and they hibernate in the wintertime. Uh, and so how, that's their adaptation to living in such a high environment.
And they, uh, just before they go into hibernation, they go and eat a whole bunch of moss that is found in the area and it, it deworms their body, gets rid of all the worms in there because if you have worms in your body in the wintertime when you hibernate, it'll kill you. It'll, they'll eat up all the nutrients. And the scat for a, a marmot is right there. And here's a bird, and it looks like a beautiful bird, and it is a bird, and a beautiful bird. It flies through uh, in the spring uh, and then nests there. Uh, and this is a cuckoo bird. Uh, and and you know, all of the Swiss uh, cuckoo clocks are very, very famous with these little tiny birds coming out, cuckoo, cuckoo, you know, when you uh, have change the hour. But the cuckoo bird isn't little tiny. It's huge. Uh, it is gigantic. And it's an interesting bird because... It goes and lays its eggs in other birds' nests and then takes off and flies south or, or flies north. Uh, and then the other bird actually raises the, the cuckoos. And the, the other birds say, boy, my, my birds here are, don't all look the same. Well, you got a cuckoo in there. Uh, and then this is one of my favorite birds in the Alps. It's the chuff, C-H-O-U-G-H. It's the Jonathan Livingston seagull. Uh, of, of the Swiss Alps. It soars all day. Uh, and um, here's an up close picture. They're yellow beaks, or orange um, legs, and they just get on the thermals and just uh, go all over the Alps. They are gorgeous. They are majestic. Uh, and they're mostly seed eaters and vegetation eaters. Be confused with the ravens. Ravens are much at lower elevations, Colleen zone, uh, and the uh, lower montane zone. Uh, and it's interesting, uh, the, uh, the ravens love to hang out around garbage dumps. Uh, and, and in my village, you had a huge population of these guys down there. Then they converted and uh, taking the garbage down to high temperature incinerators in the lower, uh, the lower valley. And all these ravens said, oh, we don't have any food. They had to put token garbage out for two years to wean the ravens off of all that garbage that they had there. Another bird that is primarily above tree line, we have them in the Rockies and the Sierras and the Cascades, are the ptarmigans. And the ptarmigans uh, uh, in the summertime are highly camouflaged. In the wintertime, they turn pure white. That's their adaptation to living uh, in this environment. They generally go into the forest under ecotone and sit underneath willows. And they will just it, be there for two weeks and just eat all the leaves on the willow. And then if you're going to eat all that time, you're going to poop a lot. So we find a bunch of, of just like you, that you have a lot of ptarmigan uh, in the area. Uh, and then this is the black grouse, which is found primarily in the subalpine zone. Uh, the female looks exactly like the uh, tar, but just bigger. The males have these incredible uh, meeting dances, which are found throughout the Alps. And I've, I've only seen it once, but wow, it was quite interesting. And then down in the lower montane zone, you have the Swiss equivalent of the wild turkey. It's called the capercali. And these are all grouse-related animals. The female looks exactly like all of these others. The males have all of the color that you've got. Lots of eagles there. No bald eagles, but this is just the golden eagle uh, found primarily uh, in the alpine zone and the subalpine zone that you've got. And you're probably wondering why I'm going to show you a picture of a little old snail and a frog. The reason is these animals are protected. Uh, why? The reason is they eat frog legs cargo. I was arrested by the gendarmes in my village because we were. I had students on a field trip to visit a cave. We were coming down from the uh, the cave, and a couple girls in the group found two mating snails. Now snails are hermaphroditic; they're male and female. And so what they do is they get the squishy parts together and they invert. And so the male part, the female parts are apart from one another, and they mate for an, uh, 24 hours. They're all pulsating and everything. These two girls thought that this was really neat. They took it to the dormitory, and they told all the students at the American College of Switzerland, come and see the mating uh, snails. Well, the, the word got to the village, and the villagers were coming up to see it too. And then the gendarmes, and it's against the law. I had to pay 50 franc fine, 25 francs apiece for each one of those for uh, harboring uh, two snails. Uh, so I just want to throw those in just for those. Um, here is an inter uh, interesting lizard. Uh, this is the viviparous lizard. 
uh, and uh, it lives primarily in the rocky areas, primarily in the montane zone uh, and the uh, upper uh, and subalpine zone. Uh, and um, uh, it is very interesting because it never lays, it's a lizard, but it doesn't lay eggs. The legs are, the legs, the eggs are uh, hatched, uh, fertilized internally, and uh, they give live birth to animals, hence the name viviparous. They also have an interesting defense mechanism. You are a predator. You, you're just about ready to eat this viviparous lizard. What will happen is they'll start vibrating their tail back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. You start watching the tail. Pretty soon the tail breaks off. You can see it's broken off here and you got a wiggling tail over here and it will run away. And, then, and that's how they survive. And then they will regrow a new tail in the next year. Uh, and, and so I would take students on hiking trails on the rocks and I'd say, shh, look up here. There are about four or five viviparous lizards on the rocks sunning themselves. And I'd slowly go up and then all of a sudden I'd go, wow! And they would all be scared and there would be a whole bunch of little tails wiggling on the rocks uh, there. So it's a defense mechanism living in the Alps. You get up into the beautiful little alpine lakes. This is right above our village here. And you go into the water and you got newts, alpine newts. Uh, and they live in those in, in beautiful little areas. And in the wintertime, how do they hibernate? They go down into the mud that you see there, along with a lot of the frogs that are found at that elevation too. They go burrowing down into the frogs too. Also, you have on the lower elevations, you have got um, the, the fire salamanders. Uh, and these are found primarily in the forests, in the wet areas. Up to the top of the mountains, above tree line. This is the alpine salamander, another adaptation, incredible adaptation to living above tree line. No, no, um, no uh, yellow spots on it uh, to get mixed up with the lower elevation ones. But secondly, it also is viviparous. It gives live birth. And that, they, then they don't have to go out and lay eggs in the ponds. They can just lay them inside. And, and so this is an adaptation for amphibians living in the alpine environment. Now, they do have one poisonous snake, the viper. These are generally found at lower elevations, warmer, rocky cliffs. Mountain climbers, as they're climbing up, always have to be careful what's on that ledge uh, as they go up because they are poisonous. And this picture I love because I was skiing down the mountain by torch one night. Uh, and then we, we came to that little uh, pond that I showed you a little while ago. And there were a whole bunch of toads just marching across the snow. We just all were put into the, the grassy area where they had come from. We found out later, this is Bufo Bufo. This is the mountain toad. Uh, and, they were all, and, and there were two of them. The big one is the female. The little one is the male. And they were going to the pond to reproduce. And we, we, since that time, I've learned that they did celestial navigation. Uh, and then when the, the pond opened up and the, the ice had melted, uh, even though there was snow around, and the the right time, the males and females would get together. The ma females would carry the male into the pond, and then they would reproduce. And so that is the story of some of the animal adaptations in the Swiss. Do Alps. you still have that knife that you used in the photos? That's your next question. I sure do. I do. Here is my Swiss. It, it, the Swiss symbol and everything is gone. I mean, it is that old. That is the original one that I had uh, there. I have a second one in my office at PSU, but I still have my Swiss Army. Uh, comment. Thanks so much. Enjoyable as usual. Someone asked the question, do you speak Swiss, which I believe it's Italian, German, or what is the third language in Switzerland? Well, Switzerland actually has four languages. Uh, French, I lived in the French speaking part of the country. Do you uh, speak you, French? German speaking is, the, uh, yes, uh, but German speaking is the largest uh, percentage of the population. But there are so many dialects of Svizzerdeutsch. And, and each valley in the valet, which is very close to us, the, where they did, they can't understand in the next valley over. So Swiss German is huge. Mm. Rome, Romanish is is found, as, which is basically Latin, which is down in the Gre uh, uh, in a small area in uh, eastern Switzerland, and then Italian. So you have four different languages. And if you look at a, a Swiss bill, a monetary bill, it's in four languages. <laughs> uh, and and so uh, 
so everything has to be done in all four languages uh, in everything that they do. So but the, the main one, high German and French are, are the main ones. And then an Italian part, part they, they have uh, Italian down there. Wow. Another comment, great presentation as always. Thanks very much. Sounds good. If anybody, if anybody wants to unmute, they can just unmute and then ask a question uh, or do a comment. Otherwise, then we'll turn it back over to you. Next question is, how is their wine? Oh, uh, really, really, really good. And so uh, the the majority of the wine uh, in Switzerland, is, especially in my area, it's cool climate, is chasselis. And so fondant, F-E-N-D-A-N-T, is the major one uh, that we have there. And then they also had Dole. Dole wine is half Pinot Noir and half Gamay. Uh, mm -hmm. And so in the canton of L.A., right next to us, uh, Dole was very, very uh, common. And I, I still remember when Bob Dole ran for, governor, uh, ran for president of the United States, Switzerland actually sent him um, a, a case of Dole wine uh that was there up in the northern part they also have Gewürztraminer and Mueller Turgau mm -hmm. Mueller Turgau and, and Riesling and uh, Mueller Turgau was developed in Turgau the canton of Turgau by Dr. Mueller uh mm -hmm. and so that is is up north but in our area Chasselis grape was the one it goes best with the uh, with the fondue and the raclette mm -hmm. another comment from Jack Paul Thanks, great presentation. Well, you know, I think what we'll do is I'll turn it back over to you. I apologize to everybody for all of the technical difficulties that occurred here. We got through it. You got a chance to hear both of them. I'm sorry it was in two. I'm sorry there was a wee bit of repetition with some of my, when I edited it out, I edited it out about a fourth of them, but uh, you, you got to see all of them. So. It was amazing to me that I could remember after all these years, the genus species names and the names of most of them. Uh, I couldn't believe it, but mm -hmm. you know, uh, miracles do happen. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so I hope that someday all of you will get a chance to head to Switzerland. Great geology, because this is the third lecture I gave. One was on the Swiss geology and the origin of the mountains, second one on the glaciers, and now the plants and animals. Take your later hosen and, and go off hiking in the Alps uh, and um, just act like Heidi uh, going through there and enjoy that. So uh, thanks to all of you for coming up tonight. And thanks, Rick and Sylvia, for allowing me in a geology group to give a talk on plants and animals. So thanks. Well, we're so glad to have you. Tell me, uh, what do you think would be the best book on alpine plants? Well, the best book, best book on alpine plants is called Alpine Flowers, uh, and uh, for Britain and Europe, and it is just absolutely great. Uh, and it comes out of Britain, and it is written oh by uh, Christopher Gray Will uh, Wilson, uh, and so that is the best one. One that I really love uh, for years and years was written by Aldous Huxley, uh, and everything is a painting, um, and uh, like this. But it's way out of print, and mine is all falling apart. But that was absolutely uh, that's how I learned all of these flowers going through the mountains. And I would come up to a new flower that I didn't even know, and I said, "Well, pull out the books and go right through it," and it was fun. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burns. We really appreciate the series that you've given to us. And if uh, everyone would consider joining the Ice Age Floods Institute or the Tualatin Historical Society, it would be much appreciated, your support. So thank you again, and we will hopefully see you all next month at our next meeting. Thank you. Good night.